I had written a article for The Atlantic about a mathematician named Hans Freudenthal, who I was just really fascinated with. He was pissed off. Um, there's really no other way to put it. He thought they were just making this horrible, horrible mistake. There are a lot of valid reasons not to send interstellar messages, but I'm not entirely sure that it being dangerous is a strong one. And I think he had a, a somewhat confused idea of the difference between communication and language. Like in movies, we're so used to seeing eight eyes and tentacles, and it just looks very foreign to us. But to some extent, it would be more startling to make contact an extraterrestrial race of mostly hairless hominid. It's October 2019. And this is episode 40 of The Wow Signal. This is your host, Paul Carr. I recently came across an announcement of a forthcoming book called Extraterrestrial Languages by Daniel Oberhaus. It seemed to me that what this book promised to be was something that was really missing, which was a complete overview and treatment of the problems questions, the science, the philosophy of how to construct an interstellar message such that it will be understood by anyone who's capable of building a radio telescope. Well, it looks like this is, in fact, that book. I have read a pre-press copy of it, and I wanted to get Daniel on the show to talk about his book, to encourage you to read it. It does cover the topic from starting from history and going into what the possible futures are of messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence. Daniel does cover a lot of the controversies as well as some of the science. A lot of it's focused around the work of Hans Freudenthal. Freudenthal was a Dutch mathematician who, as we will note later, died in 1989, and he developed a complete end-to-end -end system for communicating across interstellar distances that he called Lingua Cosmica, or Linkos for short. It turns out there was a second Linkos by someone named Olengren, which was a fair bit different. Uh, some might consider that Linkos 2.0, but some of the other characters you're running into in this book are probably quite familiar. People like Frank Drake, Carl Sagan, John Lilly, and Alexander Zaitsev, just to name a few. Also joining us on this conversation is Daniela DiPaulis, who also gives us a little update on what she's been doing lately at the end. I'm here with the author of Extraterrestrial Languages, Daniel Oberhaus. Hi, how's it going? And also joining us on this conversation is Daniela DiPaulis. Hello, Daniela. Hi. Now, Hi. Those of us who've, those of you who listened to recent episodes know Daniela pretty well. Daniel, uh, I'd like to begin with sort of the backstory, how, how you who you are that led up to this point where you decided you needed to write this book and, and uh, how, how it ended up getting in front of the public. So by day, uh, I am a staff writer at Wired Magazine where I cover space and energy. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had written a 
a article for the Atlantic about a mathematician named Hans Freudenthal, who I was uh, just really fascinated with at the time. And he is, um, you know, at least in my mind, best known for being kind of the progenitor of um, linguistic systems that are designed specifically for extraterrestrial intelligence. So I'd written a a piece about them for the Atlantic and a, an editor from MIT Press reached out and they're like, hey, you know, this is a really fascinating subject. We love doing stuff about, um, you know, kind of the stranger parts of language. Would you be interested in folding this out into a book? And, um, you know, it was something I really hadn't considered. Uh, but the more I dived into, you know, just kind of this entire world of uh, interstellar communication, I realized that there was, you know, just so much to talk about that hadn't uh, really been addressed in a satisfactory uh, long form way just yet. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I spent the last two years doing and uh, it comes out uh, this month. So it's uh, it's been a long journey, but it's been a very, very interesting one. What, where did, what year did uh, Freudenthal die? Freudenthal died in, uh, I believe it was 1989. So, it, you know, about a decade before yeah. he like message was sent out that used his coding scheme. Right. So you didn't really get a chance to talk to him. Uh, who, who did you, who did you talk to? And um, research, I, I yeah, I, I talked to a, a few different people. Um, uh, the the ones that really stand out are Sherry Wells Jensen, who is a linguist and uh, does a lot of stuff with Medi. Um, she was really just kind of instrumental in you know helping me um, kind of understand the lay of the land. Um, Carl Devito is a mathematician at the University of Arizona, so I spoke with him uh, quite a bit because he developed. Um, various schemes for uh, using mathematics and uh, the facts of science to communicate with aliens. And um, also uh, Stéphane Dumas, who recently passed away, and Yvonne Dutil. I was in contact with both of them, and they, um, you know, they have a big role in creating the cosmic call messages that were sent out in 1999 and 2003. Right. So they, yeah, everyone was very, very helpful in pulling this together. I, I don't want to, I don't want to just repeat the book for this podcast that, that's why the book exists, right? So, uh, and and I could tell uh, the audience I just read it. It's not very, it's not really that long a book. It's a couple hundred pages, maybe. Uh, yeah, so it's it's very you can digest it and add it to your reading queue pretty straightforwardly. So, let's sort of give give our audience an overview of this whole. How did this whole concept of of a language that could be used to communicate with an alien race? Uh, come about and, and what what motivated the work that's been done so far it's really just meant to be kind of a, a condensed guide that's accessible to both uh, academics and lay people if you know if you're somewhat familiar with the topic of interstellar communication or you're just getting uh, interested in it i think it'll be of interested uh, of interest to both both groups there it starts with um, kind of a history of uh, various scientists and mathematicians attempts to design languages uh, specifically for the purposes of interstellar communication. And then it goes on to kind of dive into the various aspects of that. So, um, you know, what it means to use uh, art as a um, language medium or what it means to use uh, mathematics and, you know, and tries to kind of probe questions like, is human math something that we can be considered universal? You know, is natural language out of the question when we're talking about interstellar messages? And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a lot of heady stuff, but I hope it is presented in a way that's like kind of digestible and also entertaining. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stories in the history of this right. pursuit and some, uh, some pretty interesting characters involved. So yeah, um, yeah and, kind of a, and, and kind of at, to this point, uh, there haven't been that many messages sent with, you know, with a targeted star, but uh, it's kind of still kind of a rebellious thing to do, isn't it? I mean, it, it, a lot of people don't approve of it at all. Oh, that, that, that's right. I mean, and, you know, ever since uh, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan sent the Arecibo message out, uh, you know, right after they did that, um, this astronomer named Sir Martin Ryle of the uh, uh, Royal Academy was just, he was pissed off. Um, there's really no other way to put it. He thought they were just making this horrible, horrible mistake. Um, and, you know, that's still a critique that's kind of levied against science that are, uh, scientists that are pursuing interstellar messaging. I think, I think there are a lot of valid reasons not to send interstellar messages, but I'm not entirely sure that it being dangerous is a is a strong one. Um, but yeah, it's still definitely a very very controversial pursuit. Right, and there's, there's a lot of other questions you bring up in your book 
The, one thing, one I, I did not know about this at all. There's this anecdote where someone was sending audio from the millstone radar <laughs> and he was cut off. Yeah. The colonel found out about it and cut it off in mid transmission. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a really interesting one. Um, uh, the, the artist's name right now is escaping me. Joe, um, Oh man, it'll come to me in a second, but yeah, this, uh, Joe Taylor, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Is it yes. Joe Taylor? Yes. Uh, no, Joe Davis. Joe Davis is his Joe name. Davis, and, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, in the in the 80s, I believe it was, he, uh, he he's an artist and he's done a lot of stuff with interstellar messaging. Mm -hmm. And he created a um, message in which he recorded the right. sounds of the vaginal contract contractions of ballerinas and then sent that out to a star. So, I mean, it's really unlikely that anyone will ever hear it. Uh, yeah, the, the, the military found out that they uh, <laughs> that Joe was using a... Uh, military radar for this art project and they were not exactly pleased with it and so they shut it down um, mid-transmission so <laughs> it's one of those kind of often forgotten stories in the history of doing you know interstellar messaging well, the thing that fascinated me this book the reason i wanted to read it was because i think it's really kind of an unsolved problem uh of how to create a message that could be understood by someone entirely alien from us uh, with the exception that we know that, that they're filtered down to those, those, uh, civilizations that have a technology that's not that different from ours. Right. I mean, uh, other than that, that's all you know about them, that, that they have, you know, they can do advanced tricks with electromagnetic waves, but other than that, you don't know more anymore. Uh, now that, that, that. Your book goes into a lot of depth on that. Uh, I think it, it's still an unsolved problem. We really don't know, right? I mean, if that would, if anything would work. Yeah, and I think until first contact, um, it's really just uh, an exercise and kind of educated guesswork in terms of whether this would actually be understood. Um, but you know, I, like that being said, I don't want people to think that there's just scientists out there that are just throwing stuff against a wall because it's fun to think about talking to aliens. I think there are um, various uh, approaches that uh, people can take that uh, are more justifiable in terms of um, why they think this might be understood by uh, any higher intelligence. And so, as you had mentioned, uh, really the messaging extraterrestrials is an exercise in trying to I guess, discover like the least common denominators among higher intelligences. And so, you know, historically, a lot of people have found that to be math, mathematics or like basic uh, facts of like the physical sciences. Um, and, you know, I think there is some good reason for that. But even mathematics, which seems like it should just be universal, uncontroversially, um, you know, that also kind of depends on what you think mathematics is. They might not necessarily be as as universal as we presume it to be. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question by itself. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had some discussions on a sister podcast about uh, the ontology of mathematics and how that's still quite a controversy among mathematicians themselves. So wh whether you know yeah. whether math is real in any sense, you know. Uh, and Something that strikes me in terms of a connection between mathematics and uh, also neuroscience is the similarity between brains of different mammals. So the similarity is greater than the differences. And um, so, for example, in my project where we send brainwaves into space, the neuroscientists pointed out that uh, if an alien civilization would ever receive the signal, they would not, they would be able to uh, reconstruct the three-dimensional um, um, physiology of the brain, but they would not be able to tell whether we are uh, a dog or a humans or um, any other mammals. So uh, it feels like um, also, um, um, for me at least, I perceive in a lot of this debate about uh, interstellar communication, a lack of understanding of what communication actually is in terms of how it developed also here on Earth. For example, communication between dogs and humans is a, is a process that developed over millennia uh, by living in proximity of these two different species. So uh, why do we expect as humans to send a signal out there and expect that anyone listening would be able to understand something about it 
without uh, essentially removing uh, the process of communication, how that evolves. So even uh, amongst humans, communication, I presume, began uh, very gradually, uh, uh, indeed, as a result of a process. So because of these uh, immense distances between planets and stars and um, of course, this this requires quite a lot of patience. And um, how do you see this um, uh, problem of, um, um, you know, uh, acknowledging these uh, enormous distances and time scales in um, learning how to communicate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's um, there's a lot of interesting uh, facets of all that. And I mean, to, to your point about what it means to communicate, I think early in the days of SETI and uh, um, I guess SETI, SETI with a C, um, I, I think there was a lot of confusion about what communication means. And uh, I think a large portion of that, um, and I get into this in the book a bit, is has to do with uh, John C. Lilly's involvement, who was a neuroscientist who uh, famously uh, tried to communicate with dolphins. And I think he had a, like, a somewhat confused idea of the difference between communication and language um, in, in the sense that um, it, it is possible to have communication, like communicative abilities without language. And as you had said, we see this every time we interact with our dog or we see when our cats interact with one another. Um, and, you know, in, in fairness, when uh, Lily and Sagan and all the rest of the people who were at the Green Bank conference were thinking about these issues, uh, Noam Chomsky was just kind of getting started in terms of the linguistic revolution and, you know, really reframing how we understand language. And one of the major insights from um, contemporary, you know, research in linguistics is that the primary function of language isn't actually communicative, it's uh, to order internal thoughts. And so the linearization of uh, language is really just a byproduct of, you know, our physiology and the way we communicate. But, you know, really, uh, language is a, it's largely an internal affair. And so I think when we're thinking about communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence, I'm not so sure that um, you know, interspecies communication on Earth is such a good analog for that. I think there's a lot of interesting things you can learn. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, when we're thinking about interstellar communication, we should be looking at humans almost as the analog for an extraterrestrial, as weird as that sounds, rather than a dolphin or a, a, a non-human primate. Um, and secondly, also just in terms of, as you had said, you know, dogs and humans evolved this ability to communicate over uh, millions of years living in close proximity. And obviously, we don't have that luxury when it comes to extraterrestrials. Uh, we're probably going to be communicating over the span of uh, tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of light years. So there's really probably going to be very little uh, reciprocity in, in terms of uh, speaking to one another, which adds another challenge to interstellar messaging in that uh, the message then has to be kind of somewhat self-interpreting. So aliens should be able to determine um, whether or not they're correctly interpreting the message uh, just based on the message itself, which is a really interesting problem. Um, you know, it's it's thought a lot about in computer science um, in ter- and mathematics in terms of uh, proof checkers and things of that nature. So there's some overlap there. But, um, you know, it, that's also another issue that I think is really kind of we're just beginning to understand in terms of how to uh, code for that in a in an interstellar message. Does that mean that um, maybe the only species that we might be able to communicate uh, would be very similar to us? So uh, that they would share a great deal of uh, knowledge and uh, technologies with, with us. So any any other species that is uh, very different might not be able to, or we might not be able to un- to communicate with such a species simply because we are um, sharing information that require, as you said, a rather immediate understanding, right, or some kind of connection already existing. Yeah, and I think I, I think that's a that's a point that a lot of people kind of you know, recoil at this idea that aliens might actually be more familiar to us than, you know, because like in movies, we're so used to seeing something with like eight eyes and tentacles and it just looks, you know, very uh, foreign to us. But and and I agree to some extent, it would be, you know, kind of more startling to make contact with like an extraterrestrial race of, you know, mostly hairless hominids or something. Um, but 
uh, I think there is a lot of reason to think that in terms of uh, the neurobiology of an alien, uh, I guess their methods of communication would be very similar to humans. Um, this is something that uh, I think Marvin Minsky, the, uh, the kind of the father of artificial intelligence and his partner, uh, John McCarthy, did a really good job of elaborating um, in the 70s um, because they realized that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence kind of bore a lot of similarities to their own search for artificial intelligence insofar as both uh, research paradigms were trying to understand intelligence uh, independently of how it is implemented in humans. So what does just intelligence itself mean and look like? And um, Minsky's argument was that extraterrestrials will likely think much like us in, in the sense that they are kind of faced with these same fundamental um, restraints, which are, you know, they have limits on uh, time, space, and energy, much like humans do. So that means that they will likely uh, uh, use principles of economy so they won't just waste their resources. They'll try to figure out efficient ways to put it into use. Uh, they likely won't live forever. As far as we know, you know, senescence is uh, part of the very definition of life. Um, so given that we're kind of faced with these same challenges, even though they might be living on a radically different planet, um, he argued that they'll probably come up with solutions uh, to these universal problems that are similar to our own. And one of those, he argued, uh, was uh, language. And uh, the reason language is kind of interesting is because it's a recursive procedure, so you can um, add smaller units together basically infinitely. Um, and you can also, uh, you know, pass knowledge on from generation to generation through, uh, recorded, uh, language. And then, um, yeah. So, I mean, the, uh, the language is basically an ideal solution to a lot of the problems we found. So he says, well, they, there's a good chance that they will have language and it will be not that far from our own. And, that's interesting from a theoretical point of view, but I think since in the last 40 years, there's also been a lot of experimental evidence that kind of lends weight to that. Um, one of the more interesting in that respect is how physics um, informs uh, the evolution of, uh, you know, everything from down to the cellular level to the macro level uh, of life. And so that means that if, if evolution is in some degree bounded by physics, there's a limited number of endpoints in terms of where evolution can take us. So aliens won't necessarily look just totally unimaginable to us. They probably will have features that are recognizable to us. Um, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to look like anything on Earth, but um, you know, it won't be beyond the imagination, so to speak. And so even things like um, the one I find really interesting is they've done studies on uh, nuclear bases. And if you can have more than four because everything we know on earth has uh four nuclear bases and so they created artificial ones added them in so that you could have a six base uh you know strand of dna and it, it turns out that um four bases is actually really an optimal uh solution it, it, it leads to less mutations it allows for a uh, more efficient uh uh reproduction and so you know that that suggests to me that if uh we find carbon-based extraterrestrial life uh, there's a pretty strong chance that they might even, you know, share our DNA, which is, you know, it's 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 a stretch, and of course, it's just a conjecture at this point. But I think there's a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the you just mentioned it, but one of the real epiphanies for me in this book that something I had not even thought about was that the search for AI and the search for ET are, are uh, allied, and I never, and, and in fact, in some sense. Uh, very closely the same. Least... Yeah, and I mean, that, 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 that's a, it, it's one of those things where I think that I think AI really is the future. And I think, you know, Carl Sagan and Iosif uh, Shiklovsky have both, I think, really convincingly argued that if we do find life, it'll probably be more advanced than us. And if we look at the trajectory of life on Earth, at least intelligent life, it is toward kind of a post-biological um, intelligence um so i you know i personally see humans heading towards more integration with machines um as, as we um kind of go over the next few centuries so i don't think it's too far-fetched to think that if we do make contact you know it might it might be with something that's more machine than flesh right now have we we're still we are still a long way from solving the problem of artificial general intelligence we're very good at building little niche smart things 
but uh, is is there? You feel that uh, if we do make contact, it's probably with something that has enormous amounts of computing power built into it. But yeah, I mean, I I think that 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 would be a uh, a fair assumption. Um, the, the the tricky thing about that is like when I look at SETI here on Earth. Um, the, break, the breakthrough project has kind of helped this a little bit in terms of uh, giving more funding and for uh, data uh, retention and analysis. But until recently, um, it seemed like the SETI Institute, one of their largest problems was um, just managing all the data that they were collecting. And, and then beyond that, um, figuring out ways to implement uh, artificially intelligent algorithms to interpret that data and look for signals. And so I would like to hope that, uh, you know, e uh, ET's version of SETI is a little bit more funded and they probably take it maybe a little bit more seriously than our own. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, personally in terms of message design, I think the best way to go about it is to send massive corpuses of natural language text and, uh, perhaps, um, include with that something like, uh, Alexander Allengren's, uh, meta language, which, uh, he called Linkos to use to interpret that. And Linkos is basically like, it's a, uh, uh, it's a logical language that ha has its roots in kind of the computing revolution here on earth, but you can use it to logically describe the relationship between elements of a natural language text. And so I think if we're going to talk about like energy efficiency and just like the sheer amount of information that you can pack into a message, um, you know, I think it makes the most sense. We already have so much textual, uh, uh, stuff here on earth. We, we write so much. Mm -hmm. And so if we can send a large body of that in natural language. Um, you know, I think if, if, if as you said, an AI, uh, artificially intelligent, uh, you know, extraterrestrial receives that they will be able to hopefully run, uh, language analysis, uh, algorithms on that and kind of tease out, uh, the significance of the, the natural language we sent, which could be aided by things like, um, Linkos and other, you know, specially made yeah. messages. And there's, there's something that I saw in your book that I had, I mean, another thing I didn't know about before, uh, which is actually more interesting than the guy at MIT, but, uh, I mean, sorry, at, uh, Millstone Radar, uh, it was, uh, somebody sent the Ella chatbot into space once. Uh, yes. Now, it was that in terms of executable code, how did, how did that work? Yeah, so that was uh, made by a programmer who, um, at the time, was based in China. I'm not sure if he's still there. Um, his, his name was Kevin Koppel, and he had entered a chatbot uh, in this, uh, it's basically a Turing uh, competition that they hold every year called the Loebner Prize. And the idea is that judges interact with chatbots, and um, I think there's also humans involved. And so basically, you're trying to fool the judges into having the most realistic response from your chatbot. So like they should think that they're talking to a human. And the year before Ella was sent into space, she actually won the Loebner prize. So in, in some ways she was kind of like the most advanced natural language processing algorithm that existed publicly. I'm sure, you know, the government had probably more advanced, uh, uh, versions of that. But so Kevin's was the best AI we had, uh, at the time. And in 2003, they added her code to the cosmic call messages. Um, it was written in Visual Basic, uh, which, you know, the odds of an extraterrestrial uh, just happening to know this very conventional coding paradigm on Earth are small. But, you know, at, at some level that does get reduced to machine language. And so perhaps they might be able to tease out, uh, you know, Ella's code and implement the software if they're familiar with, like, using binary code as a way to uh, execute logical instructions. Um, but, you know, regardless, I think, it, I think it was important if for no other reason than symbolically and saying, you know, maybe the best way to go about, uh, uh, interstellar messaging is thinking about it in terms of computers talking to computers rather than humans talking to, uh, human like extraterrestrials, which is kind of, you know, I guess a different way of thinking about it than has historically been yeah. the case. Yeah. And one question I had was that uh, in interstellar messaging, there, there's a couple of things you can try to accomplish. One is, here's some information about us humans, right? 
uh, mm -hmm. in our culture and our mathematics and our science and so on. Uh, another thing you can do is say, here's how to send a message back to us that we will understand, right? which is a little, a much harder problem, I think, but, uh, it, uh, what, what is, what is, is, is that, that latter one, is that, is that received as much attention as the former? I think definitely in the early days, which, you know, I hadn't actually thought about how kind of bifurcated the history of, uh, Medi is in this respect, but I think it really is. So, um, uh, Hans Freudenthal, kind of the guy who got me interested in this, um, when he was designing his version of uh, an interstellar messaging system, which was also called Linkos, um, super confusing. There's two of them, and they're very, very different. Um, but he he really was thinking about that, as was the guy who kind of got this all started, this uh, uh, zoologist named Lancelot Hogman, who uh, created a language called the Astroglossa. And in both cases, these two interstellar languages um, one of the main focuses was more teaching uh, ET how to teach us, which I think is like a really interesting perspective in that not only do you have to teach them how to understand this language, but then also how to wield it in a reply so that we can then understand it. Um, whether or not that's actually uh, necessary, you know, I think humans are pretty smart and I would like to think that if we received uh, an intelligent message from space, we'd be able to crack that nut um, you know, eventually it might be very hard, but um, I think we, I think we have the brain power to do it. But this could potentially facilitate things. Um, the only, I guess, uh, kind of uh, naively optimistic uh, part of this is that, um, based on how SETI is going now, it seems like if we do make contact, uh, this civilization is going to be very far from our own. And so, um, even if we teach an ET how to reply to us, it might take hundreds of years for their reply to come back. And that would mean we would then have to teach multiple generations on earth how to understand the, our, our own message. So there's, there's a lot of education involved here and just trying to understand it, even if we teach them how to teach us. So, um, yeah, but I don't know. I think it, I think it makes for a more, uh, uh, intelligible message if you're also thinking about a reply. Right. Now, uh, this is more Danielle's area, but, uh, one of your chapters of your book is about art and use it, using art to communicate across, uh, across, uh, to, to, uh, ETs. Um, you mentioned that art might in some sense have a, a kind of a universality to it that we're not going to get from math or, or is that, uh, is that just uh, one of the possible conjectures that we're making here? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think art is valuable to include in uh, interstellar message for many reasons. Um, I'm using art kind of loosely. Uh, historically, a lot of the messages that we have sent or thought about have uh, kind of focused on music. And I think there is also a good reason for that. But also visual art, uh, you know, motion pictures, things of that nature as well are included in this. And um, yeah, I, I think music is interesting in that respect because, uh, you know, music uh, eth ethnographers... <clears throat> have uh you know studied the prevalence of music in cultures across the planet and next to language it's stunning how at least some elements of music whether it's rhythm uh you know beats or what have you are present in every culture on earth and so they haven't identified what exactly about music is universal but it seems to share a lot of similarities with language in that almost every single culture develops some version of music and so I think, you know, if we're going to represent ourselves as a species to an extraterrestrial, um, you know, math and science is a great thing to include in the message. But if, if you do it without art, you're almost kind of misrepresenting yourself because of how integral art is to the human experience. You know, this is something that really, I think, differentiates us from other uh, animals that we share this planet with. And, um, you know, it's not and it's also just like it's not about poetics either, I think you know, by sending music uh, to an extraterrestrial intelligence, you actually can tell them quite a bit about uh, human physiology, for instance. You know, they, they will understand our um, range of sonic perception, which is much different than many other animals. So they'll know we can hear from, say, uh, you know, 20 hertz up to 20,000 uh, hertz or whatever it is, and, th and, and things like that, or, you know, how, how finely we're able to differentiate between uh, notes on a scale. Um, so 
yeah, there's a lot I think an extraterrestrial can learn from analyzing our music. Um, in addition to just understanding that we express ourselves artistically, which is um, hopefully not unique in the universe, but it's certainly unique on Earth. Right. Well, I mean, the first thing I one of the, if I saw an interstellar message from one of the first things I would want to do is convert the symbols into pitches and see <laughs> if it made any sense yeah. musically. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, I, I guess I'm curious also to know, Daniela, since you're uh, very much involved with this, you know, what are like, what are your thoughts on using art as a basis for a message? Is that something that you see as important? Yes, absolutely. I, I wonder whether it is a universal language because uh, art really varies um, incredibly between cultures and also between people. So um, uh, contemporary visual language is usually not well received by people who are not uh, familiar with it. It requires some uh, study that um, maybe it's not as intuitive as maybe more figurative language. So, um, but I think indeed, as you said, uh, music sound, there is something, of course, that uh, we all um, there, there is a basic, uh, I think, um, element like rhythm and uh, the, in, in music that we all understand uh, very intuitively. And so do some animals um, like elephants. I, I, I read also parrots seems to have a, a great sense of rhythm that perhaps uh, is connected to the ability of also um, underst- kind of having a sense of you know, the, the rhythm for language and so on. So it seems to be strictly connected. Uh, I don't know about visual or visual arts, because of course also we don't know whether this extraterrestrial intelligence has any auditory system or a visual system. We simply don't know. And uh, so, um, but I, um, I, something which I find very interesting that also I wanted to ask you is, um, at least during my I'm very involved with the topic of safety, as I told you, and I find that over the years, the interest in this topic from the general public is increasingly increasingly growing. And I was wondering if you have an answer for that. Why do you think um, safety is now more um, accepted also and also discussed by the general public? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think I think there's two ways to answer this. The first is that I think definitely in terms of the general public, people are a lot more interested. Um, I'm not sure uh, why that is. I think part of it is perhaps because we're just more steeped in high technology today um, than we ever have been before. You know, uh, science and technology are increasingly part of like the general conversation, whereas before it was maybe, you know, you, you, you're you a nerd if you're interested in, you know, computers and such things. But nowadays, everyone and their mom uses a computer and they use very sophisticated technology. And so... I think this idea of scanning the sky for radio waves doesn't seem as strange in an era where a billionaire can build a rocket that lands itself. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, obviously publicly funded SETI programs, at least in the United States, uh, were killed in the 90s. And as far as I can tell, you know, NASA might still be a little bit interested in astrobiology. But as far as publicly funded SETI goes, there's still you know, at least in the United States, no interest from uh, our congressional representatives in pouring money into this. So, to, you know, that isn't a huge vote of confidence, I guess. Um, you know, people aren't exactly banging down the door saying we need to spend more of our taxes searching for uh, extraterrestrials. But the nice thing is, is thanks to, um, you know, philanthropists like Yuri Milner, who uh, bankrolled the SETI project or the Breakthrough Listen project and um, other breakthrough initiatives through Berkeley. Um, you know, I think, I, I guess I'm really excited about that, uh, donation. I think they're going to do amazing things. They're already doing amazing things at Breakthrough. Um, so yeah, I think the com- the combination of, uh, exposure to high technology and also, um, these kinds of votes of confidence from people like Yuri Milner are doing a lot to kind of, uh, get the public excited about SETI, which I think is really exciting. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I spoke uh, not long ago to Sophia Sheikh, who uh, aims to be the first woman to get a PhD in SETI. Uh, I love that. What uh, university? She's at uh, Penn State, one of Jason oh. Wright's students. And uh, 
she, um, you know, she's optimistic that public funding will return. Um, she's not sure when, but she's making her career on it. So, um, the, uh, the, and I think what the, the city people have gotten really smart about things like making sure there's some kind of scientific return, even if they don't find a signal. And, uh, oh, yeah, do, right. And I mean, you, you know, we're, we're, we're we're not the only ones looking for this either. You know, China recently, they brought their fast telescope online and that, right. that was a publicly funded project. And that's going to be, you know, they, they have the best uh, telescope in the, the SETI game right now. So, you know, pe other countries are doing this. I don't think it's, you know, as far fetched to think that we might too one day. Yeah. Um, well, Daniel, I know you have to go pretty soon. Um, is there any? I have one last okay. question. Okay. If I have one minute. Um, I wonder if also in your, I didn't get the chance to read the book yet, uh, but I, what is your idea of receiving a message? What do you think uh, would happen? How would people um, receive this, um, well, kind of breakthrough news? Yeah, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, especially over the last few years in the United States as kind of this whole uh, topic of uh, our idea of fake news has kind of come into the popular imagination. And I wonder, you know, okay, if we were to receive a message from space tomorrow and it was unambiguously intelligent, you know, something that you just couldn't mistake this as natural phenomena. I wonder, you know, given how conspiratorially minded so much of the population is these days, like would people even take it seriously or would it like kind of just get lost in the churn um, because no one can tell if it's real or not? Um, so I think that's, you know, kind of one pessimistic view. Uh, you know, I think realistically, if we do receive a message, it might be somewhat ambiguous, kind of like, uh, you know, the title of your podcast, the wow signal, um, that, you know, th there's still kind of that question, like, was it, wasn't it, who knows? And, um, you know, I could also see it going that way. It's like, did we receive one? Did we not? And then you have years of analysis or follow up trying to, to prove it. Um, so, you know, if we did receive an unambiguous message, I would, I would personally, as an optimist, I would love to think that, uh, you know, it would bring the, the, the uh, countries of the world together and we would, uh, you know, cooperate and figure out how to join this, uh, you know, the, the cosmic community. Um, <laughs> that might be a, a bit naive, but, you know, I, I think it also depends on who receives it. So, you know, if China were to receive it first, would, is that information that they would share? Um, you know, Shijin Liu has a great uh, novel about that very, that very uh, reality. So, um, yeah, it's not really a great answer to your question. I could see it going several different ways. I, I, I personally hope it goes well. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess as a last question, would you like to elaborate any more on um, what you want your readers to take away from the book? Yeah, sure. So I guess, um, yeah, th to me, I think one of the um, most unfortunate things about, uh, you know, SETI and also METI messaging extraterrestrial intelligence is how so many people kind of just treat it as like a very wonky thing with no real practical applications. Um, but as you had mentioned, uh, SETI does a lot of uh, uh, cutting edge uh, science, even if they're not finding uh, signals from intelligent um, uh, extraterrestrials. And I think, you know, the same could be said uh, for designing messages that are to be broadcast into space as well. Um, you know, that there's a lot of interesting questions, I think, when you think about designing a interstellar message. And it really forces us to think about what makes us humans, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, any other species. And so rather than thinking of how am I different from someone from another culture, it shifts your perspective to make you ask how are we the same at like at what fundamental level how deep does this go and um, i think asking those questions are very valuable in terms of what they can um, do for uh, interpersonal relationships on earth and so at this point um I, I i personally don't think we should be involved uh in the business of sending messages into space i think at this point it's a waste of resources because it's basically a crapshoot um, 
you know, we know some, actually we know a lot of planets have, our stars have planets around them, but we don't really know uh, which one, if any, holds intelligent life. So you're kind of just, you know, sending a message out in a bottle and hoping someone picks up, which isn't really a great or scientific way to go about it. Um, but that being said, you know, we don't have to broadcast. We can spend our uh, time and energy figuring out how to design messages in the event that we do receive uh, an interstellar message at some point in the future. We'll be ready to respond and have thought, you know, robustly about this subject. So, yeah, I guess my main takeaway is thinking about aliens helps us think about ourselves. And it's a very valuable pursuit for that reason. Yeah, I agree. Well, thanks, uh, Daniel. It's been uh, really interesting having you on. And uh, we will, again, uh, feel free to send me a uh, a bio and a headshot or, or a headshot, uh, either one, uh, whenever you have time. Uh, this will probably be, it'll be out in a few days. Uh, Sounds great. I'll try to, I'm definitely going to beat your publication date so people become aware of the book, uh, which I believe is the 22nd, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. I've got my copy on pre-order, <laughs> even though I've already read the book. <laughs> uh, it'd be nice actually to have it on paper. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it turned out beautifully. They did a great job uh, binding it and everything. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, Danielle and Paul, this was, it's a lot of fun. So I look forward oh. to, to hearing yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Uh, Bye. Thanks. Daniela, I just wondering if you wanted to add a few more words about what you've been up to in the last year or so. I know you've been really busy with uh, Cogito. Yes, yeah, it has been very busy. We have a documentary uh, which is ready. There's a documentary about the the project, and I'm um, going to present it at the Breakthrough Listen boot at the International Astronautical Congress in Washington in um, 10 days. So oh. if anybody is there, uh, please come to the Breakthrough Listen area and uh, you'll be able to watch the, um, the reportage of the, of the pro project uh, for which we send brainwaves into space as well as other artworks uh, that will be on display. So the um, Breakthrough Listen is now partnering with several artists, including myself, and I think there will be a very interesting display of artworks um, put together by Claire Webb, who is a researcher in the field of uh, philosophy, and uh, she has been uh, working with the uh, SETI Institute and Breakthrough Listen for uh, quite some time. And uh, yes, um, we are. I'm now working uh, with, on a new project that I'm not uh, yet able to share with you. I will tell you a little bit more when um, the concept is better developed uh, and when we are ready to launch it. So um, yes, I'm uh, very pleased with how um, people are receiving this idea of sending brainwaves into space. I think it's um, um, it resonates a lot with people. And um, it's always interesting for me whenever I present a project to hear their feedback, their thoughts about about it. I noticed you've become a qualified radio telescope operator. Yes, that's right. That was already a year ago. So yeah. um, it, it is very um, specific to the Dwingelo radio telescope in the Netherlands. So every uh, telescope requires a specific training. So unfortunately, I would not be able to... Um, operate, let's say, the Arecibo dish or um, the Green Bank telescope. Uh, the, every every telescope has its own um, um, instrumentation, and um, so. But I'm qualified indeed to steer and um, uh, use the Dwingelo radio telescope, which is um, um, a 25 meter dish, and it's a, a relatively simple in terms of instrumentation compared to more. Um, uh, contemporary telescopes. I'd like to thank 
Daniel Oberhaus, author of Extraterrestrial Languages, coming out soon on MIT Press, for joining us for this episode 40 of The Wow Signal, along with my co-host, Daniela DePaulis. As always, if you want to find any information about this podcast, episode 40, or any other episodes, or what we call bursts, which are our shorter format, that's all at wowsignalpodcast.com. If you have any questions or comments, then by all means, feel free to let us know. Our email address is wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. And if you email us and give us permission to use your name, we might even read your comment on air and possibly even get an answer to any questions you have. So feel free to communicate with us. The way to support this podcast is through patreon.com. Go to patreon.com slash wowsignal. Or if you click on support us at our homepage at wowsignalpodcast.com, you'll see where you can buy t-shirts as well. So by all means, let's hear from you and... We will be back soon with episode 41 or perhaps another burst. I do have some plans near term in October, November to get some more people on the show. Most of the topics will be SETI or MEDI related, but not all. So stay tuned. Music for this episode was by DJ Spooky, Jason Robinson, and George Krob. This stuff is far! And a look comes across your face You try to fathom distances of all the stuff in space But you can't wrap the bacon of your mind around the beacon This has been The Wow Signal A podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons Or is presented with the permission of the artist The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution, share alike license. Far, far, far away, we're talking far. Like over far. Take it there by car in a day. It's super duper crazy far. But I'm just pulsars, quasars, and stars. I mean, it's far, 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 far. far. If there's some doubt, listen to a shout. This stuff is far. It's full of stars. I sense all the explosions going off inside your brain. As your mind gets blown by what I just did explain. Sorry if my words might drive you all insane But that's what happens when precision is your middle name So with an exacting factor Like some sextant or protractor Using details quite semantic I'll show how huge is this gigantic This stuff is far It's really far This stuff is far, far, far away We're talking far Like over far And not just pulsars, quasars, and stars I mean it's far, 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 far. If there's a doubt, listen to a shout This stuff is far it's Too big to explain in any concise ways It might just have to take 365 days I hope that I have offered up some technical assistance and haven't caused your ticker too much ventricle resistance But you have got to listen and trust my insistence That I am very accurately describing the distance One more time This stuff is far It's really far This stuff is far, far, far